Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a Friday Reads that I'm probably going to post on Saturday, so a weekend read. The last thing that I finished is probably the, the piece that I was the most impressed by, and that is Colson Whitehead's The Nickel Boys. This tells the story of boys at a reform school in the early 60s in the southern US. It is obviously the site of incredible abuse, physical and sexual and emotional and psychological and the whole bit. There is a lot of the historical background because we get a bit of the s notions of what's coming with the civil rights movement in the background and the reform school itself is segregated so we're following two boys who are in the black section of the camp but we are aware that this white section exists and there's a Mexican kid who gets bounced between the two sometimes which is occasionally played humorously and occasionally played as a poking at the ridiculousness of racial segregation kind of. The book also contains scenes that are set in the late 60s and then later points leading up to the modern day going back and forth set in New York City with one of the characters as well as an opening scene that involves archaeologists finding unmarked graves on the site of the reform school. Uh, I think it's hard to read this and not compare it to the various residential school memoirs and novels that we're seeing a lot of in Canlit these days because it is very similar to that and I think to a certain extent I probably would have enjoyed that not having read so many of those style of stories just because it is something fairly similar and while this it does involve kids who are getting sent away for virtually nothing it, it still feels slightly different than the full-on racism because this is like three-quarters racism as opposed to 100% racism that you see with the residential school system which is maybe a horrific comparison to be making but it was hard not to just because it is the same kind of story and similarly depressing. The bits with the flash forwards and flashbacks are played in a way that seems to be leading you towards one set of expectations but because of the tone that the main story has I didn't think it set that up well enough. It's clearly meant to be a bit of a twist at one point and I didn't think the twist worked because of the tone. It was clear that the misleading element of the expectations that were being set was never believable so I thought the twist was very predictable but your mileage may vary on that. I thought that was the only negative of this and I thought this was brilliant otherwise although I didn't enjoy this nearly as much as I loved Zone 1 which is Colson Whitehead's artsy zombie novel which I think was fantastic and which I like more and more the more that I think about it. So we'll see if I like that more and more the more that I think about it but having just finished it I thought it was very good. I also read another uh, Europe comics localization through NetGalley recently released book called The Last of the Atlases. This is an interesting science fiction gritty gangster story. It's a bit of an alternative universe because it is set in France in more or less the current day but there are robots although we don't see a lot of the robots it's very background and it's very their equivalent to a truck at this point in the story and also this is also a world in which Algerian independence happened 15 years later than it happened in reality so some of the social and the demographic pieces are a little bit different uh, which makes for some interesting things at this point this is purely the first volume and I believe there are 11 volumes of this so far although I don't believe they've been published in English yet I think this is this one just came out about a month ago and I think more are to come. This is the setup for it I thought the translation and this was translated by Edward Gauvin who's doing a lot of the Europe comics translations and he is fantastic at it. I think a lot of the translations that were done by humanoids 10-15 years ago are not nearly at the level that these translations are. I've been really impressed with what they've done with this. As a story on its own it doesn't really go anywhere because this is purely setting the scene but for that I thought tonally it was very good. I think the art style is the grittier style and I'll insert some of the pictures here but that is kind of what it is. Next up I read a book that I'm a little bit baffled as to the way the marketing has gone for this. This is called The Pretty One by Kia Brown. The subheading on this one is life, pop culture, disability, and, and other reasons to fall in love with me. It's being sold as being a set of pop culture and social commentary essays but it never gets particularly deep into it. Now she, fame is probably a strong way of putting it, she became known on kind of disability Twitter for doing this disabled and cute hashtag and this book is written in a cute style but I think the problem with that is that it means there isn't a lot of depth to the pieces so she'll be talking about pop culture pieces and 
at first glance it looks like she's going to be evaluating things but then it turns out that she's really looking at it in terms of the way it impacted her personally which is fine but there's there will be points like where she'll comment on the success of Black Panther and A Wrinkle in Time and financially and critically A Wrinkle in Time was not a success but what she's talking about is how it affected her and that's certainly a fair angle to go at your commentary but the way this is marketed it seems like it's going to do something deeper and it just doesn't and similarly this is an issue I have with I've had with a lot of memoirs of people who are writing about things that just happened a few years ago but they're and they're deeply personal things. Interspersed with the pop culture bits are her feelings about herself and her basically self-acceptance and body acceptance. And because she's basically pointing to a moment in 2016, it hasn't been very long. And she, I think, is about 27 or 28 at this point. And as with, I think I had the a similar comment with uh, Tilly Walden spinning, it just doesn't feel like enough time has passed to really reflect on that. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to hear, okay, great, you found this way to love yourself, but there just isn't the depth that you would expect for, for a memoir that's being sold this way. So it was fine. I think it, this is something that I think would be a lot more fun for people who are closer to her in age. Now, I turned out to be reading this at the same time as my friend's daughter, who I've mentioned before, I call her my fake niece, who's uh, 15. And we both kind of felt that some of the parts where she's talking about children's entertainment that I was too old and my niece was too young for it. So if you are around her age, I think some of that part will be more entertaining. But um, yeah, I just wasn't the right target market for this. And as with a lot of memoirs, I do sometimes wonder why people don't leave at least five years between their big personal revelation and the writing of the book, because I just feel like people would have more to say at that point. And as usual, I listened to a couple of audiobooks the first of which was Mindy Kaling's second memoir, Why Not Me, which is mostly her discussing the run-up to her production of her show The Mindy Project and then the first couple of years of that, as well as a couple of stories about her university experience and also a weirdly long story about a pseudo-romance that she had with a White House staffer. That particular pseudo-romance story I found pretty tedious, but the rest of this I would say was consistently amusing in the way that you want when you're listening to a memoir from a comedy writer. And I think her narration was hit almost the perfect tone for that, in that if you are entertained by either her writing or her show persona, or it, it balances those pieces out. So I thought this was well done. I'm probably not 100% the target market for this because I wasn't a huge fan of either The Office or of her show, although I kind of secondhand watched The Mindy Project because my ex-husband used to watch it, so it, I was in the room. But I found this thoroughly entertaining. But it is not particularly deep. It is fluff. But it's fun fluff, so. And after that, I listened to David Cherry Andy's I've Been Meaning to Tell You, A Letter to My Daughter. A lot of authors have been doing books lately where they're writing something to their son or daughter or nephew or niece. I thought this one was interesting in that he's writing it to his daughter as opposed to his son because a lot of the ones that I've seen have been female writers writing to their daughter or niece and male writers writing to their son or nephew. So writing to his daughter shouldn't have been surprising, I, it, but it did kind of surprise me just because so many of the other books in this style are people writing to their same gendered child. So David Cherry Andy wrote Brother, which was on one of the Canada Reads list and has been up for some of the Canadian prizes. He also wrote Sukiant, which came out a few years ago. And most of this is about perceptions of culture and background and Canadianness. David Cherry Andy is from Scarborough. His family moved to Canada in the 60s from Trinidad. His mother is black and his father is South Asian. And his wife is Anglophone, but from Quebec and of British heritage. Family has been in Canada for several centuries and they now live in Vancouver. And his kids go to a, not a Francophone school, but a French immersion school. So he talks a bit about the challenge of that because he himself doesn't speak French. And so he, he kind of talks about how he's not an immigrant, but he feels like one because he can't help his kids with their homework, uh, which is interesting. He has a chapter where they all do DNA tests and he comments on, you know, he's second generation Canadian, but his family was in Trinidad for hundreds of years, but they have no indigenous heritage from Trinidad. His wife has no indigenous heritage, even though her family's been in Canada for hundreds of years. And what does that mean? And being settlers. 
And he talks about how he didn't have the same awareness when he lived in Ontario versus living in Vancouver. Talks about the different kinds of racism, both in Canada and in the United States and in Trinidad. And this, in book form, was only 90 pages. This was only about two and a half hours. And I was surprised about how much he managed to talk about in such a small amount of time. I didn't anticipate this to be as successful as it was, just because it was so short and he does talk about so many different things. But it really worked. Although I will say that he narrates this himself. Uh, I guess he's been in Vancouver for 20 years now, but he really sounds like he's from Vancouver. Like, he does not have a GTA or a Scarborough accent anymore. He sounds like he's from Vancouver, which was kind of interesting. Like, wow, because they, they, they enunciate things more than we do here. And I thought that was kind of interesting, just as an aside. Yeah, so I thought that was very good. Oh, I also read one of the short essays that... Uh, Amazon's doing this project of getting authors to write short essays that they make uh, free or discounted on the Kindle regularly. And I read uh, Jacqueline Woodson's Before Her, which is kind of a story about family and love and was quite cute. It is something that you would expect to see as one chapter in a longer memoir. It was reasonably compelling. And the only one that I had read before was W. Kamau Bell's Everybody Loves Kamau, which is similarly one chapter. That one felt like if I hadn't just listened to his memoir, reading that would have felt like it was missing something. In any case, I thought this stood alone significantly better. So if you are interested in her life or a fan of her writing, because I think she writes primarily for a younger audience. And so this was interesting because I hadn't been familiar with her writing for adult entertainment. Anyway, if you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought of them. And that's it for now. Ciao.